hear me okay? Fabulous. Now, I know some of you have just attended the previous session on ESG, so we'll try not to duplicate them. But this will be focused more around sort of the supply chain side of things, the why, the what, and the how. So again, as uh, Sean said, I spent 20 years in industry. I'm very practical. So we'll have questions as we go and again at the end, but let's try and have a really sort of pragmatic discussion about, about how we move things forward. I think we're all clear on the imperative at this stage. So, as we said, the topic, the, the why, the how, the what. So I won't drain this, because this is related to the session you've just had. I just wanted to, to highlight the complexity around the ESG network. So for those of us who are as old as I am, when we started in supply chain, it was relatively simple. You know, health and safety was very important, and everything else was balancing service cost cash. Now, even just within ESG, there's so many interconnected dimensions. We look at uh, carbon. One of the big sources of carbon is petrol. To move away from petrol for energy, you need batteries because of solar and wind. To have batteries, you need rare earth minerals. To get rare earth minerals, you need to disturb indigenous communities. So for, straight from the solution in one, you're creating a problem in another. And then you're moving across to governance and what you do with those used batteries. So it's a really complex environment we're working in. So if we look at a few facts and figures around that to sort of contextualize how big the scale of the problem is, and also the opportunity. So I always think this is a good headline number. Bill Gates calls it out a lot. 51 billion tons of greenhouse gases being emitted every year. So it's a good scaling number, and it's, I think 50 million is easy to keep in your head, which helps understand how, how much of a problem we're facing and when there's discussions on different technologies and solutions, how impactful they are against that scale. Another one that I found quite shocking in this, in this day and age was the modern slavery figure. 740 million people are still victims of modern slavery. I'm sure I'm not alone in having been shocked two years ago when we realized that in Leicester, in Leicester, up the road, there were modern slavery factories producing clothing in this country. So I think all of us who procure anything have an absolute responsibility to make sure we're really, really certain that neither our suppliers or our suppliers, suppliers, or our suppliers, suppliers, suppliers are in any way involved in this massive global problem. On the positive side, we're now down to eight of the big supply chains drive half of the world's emissions. So if we can focus on a number of areas, we can make some really big differences which helps. And one thing that for those of us in supply chain has become more and more clear is that scope three, depending on your business, it can be 90%. Is that me that's causing the humming? 90% of your emissions. Um, and that has historically been, I think, not looked at directly. And many of us have stood there watching our CEO stand behind a lectern and announce the net zero commitment. Like, oh my God, they haven't spoken to the supply chain. How are we going to do this? What is the pace at which we're going to do this? What is the investment we need to do this? So the supply chain is massively impactful, both at a company level and at a societal level, if we're going to hit our net zero targets. On the plus side, there is investment behind it. That 50 billion investment figure is from 2020. So there is time, energy, and money going against this, which gives some hope. And what also gives hope is 56% of the G250 companies included climate change as a risk in their annual report. So again, it's gone from the realm of nice to have to this, this is a business imperative. This is critical. So I thought those numbers were, they give a bit of context to it. So then we look at the value that can be created for the supply chain beyond the good in itself of reducing carbon. Um, the first one is brand permission. I think our consumers are increasingly aware that spending is voting. Every time you choose to give your, in these days, precious resources to a business, you're endorsing their business model. And people today are very conscious of that. Again, for the older of us in the room, back in the day, Marlborough used to make um, accessories and jeans. Can you imagine today, a 20-something, being seen dead in tobacco branded clothing? So that whole brand thing has completely shifted. The second one is predictable financial capital. 
So whilst we're often driven by short-term quarterly annual targets, investors, both investors and lenders, look over a much longer horizon. So um, I work in Bringa and we've got a climate change scenario risk model. And companies like BlackRock, um, legal in general, companies with trillions of dollars of assets, every single investment they have, they run it through this tool. Because before they put their money in, they want to understand what is the climate exposure of this investment. Are they likely to have stranded assets? Have they potential risks around human rights? And it's really, really a key investment concern. So in order to build our businesses, we need that financial flow. So sustainable finance is increasingly more important. The third one is good old fashioned cost. So a low waste supply chain is a lower carbon supply chain. So again, back in the day, sales would, you know, phone, those of us who are in logistics, you'd be phoned and told, ship two pallets, I don't care. Now we're going, no, no, no. If there's a customer service crisis, we'll, we'll ship the two, but we're going to fill the truck. They're going to get all of next week's order as well. The days of shipping air or putting things on a plane because someone was late in doing their paperwork are gone. And that drives costs as well. The third is regulatory resilience. So this is a slightly more challenging one in the UK at the moment with our vibrant and exciting political climate. But um, there's an awful lot going on from a regulatory point of view, both locally and internationally. Things like the plastic tax are one, and carbon taxes are coming, and there will be carbon border taxes to take into account as well. And every decision we make in the supply chain, they, they tend to be long term. Decisions we make now, we will live with for 10, 15, 20 years. So it's really important that we look at those future risks, because otherwise we could find ourselves re-engineering a part of our supply chain. Um, the reputational part is increasingly important in this social media driven world. Um, I mean, Tesco. We all know Tesco. We probably all know people who work in Tesco. They're lovely people. Two years ago, they were on the front of every newspaper because their Christmas cards used child labour. Tesco did not do that on purpose. Nobody in Tesco set out to use child labour. But their processes were not robust enough. Their vetting of their suppliers and their sub-suppliers was not robust enough. And they ended up with product on their shelf that had been made by children. And that went through social media like wildfire. And we all know today that every mistake you made will get amplified very quickly. So the reputational part is again critical. And then the last one is operational resilience. In order to know your supply chain at that level of detail, that you're confident in what each of your suppliers are doing, implies a much greater level of visibility and oversight than we've had in the past, and that in itself gives you resilience. So there's quite a few advantages beyond the good in itself of carbon. So loads of good reasons why your CFO should open the checkbook. Um, when we were having these conversations with our clients, there's a few triggers that come up quite a lot about why or why now. Often it's new and roll. So as someone arrives, A, they're potentially clearing up some items left by their predecessor, but B, they're looking forward into their legacy. So new and roll is often a time to review the sustainability of that supply chain. The second is the external push, the public net zero targets, the regulatory, all that goes with it. And of course, the third is being bitten by those media scandals. So those are often good triggers to action. So. Now that we've decided we need to do it, now that we've got loads of other good reasons as well as carbon, as the business benefit, what's that transformation approach going to look like? So there's probably a few key steps. The first is, you know, what is my carbon footprint? How am I going to assess that? So good old fashioned stuff, understand what's there, um, screen them all, including your suppliers, get your scope three. And there's good, solid calculation methodologies out there. So start by you know, facing that reality. And doing that, looking across the full breadth of your suppliers and categories. Because a lot of us manage the top 80% of our spend, uh, which is perfectly appropriate in almost every scenario. However, a lot of our carbon, a lot of our scope three, could be coming from those tail suppliers. So when you start doing your baseline, you do need to measure across the full breadth. And we'll touch a little more on this. That, that measurement's not particularly easy, and the data quality is often not brilliant. But in this case, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. 
get some get decent data, figure out the proxy if required, figure out the average for that industry if required, and get yourself a good baseline map. Once you've got that, then you look about what are the reduction levers I can use. And this is where the segmentation is really interesting. So we worked before with a fabulous um, toy manufacturer. And they segmented their suppliers. For example, one was resin, because they use plastic, so that, that, which is embodied carbon. So that was one really important category for them. Um, another was around their packaging. Another was around their logistics. But they factored that out by category and said, for each of these categories, what can we do? And there's short-term things and long-term things. So say in that example of resin, they, their long-term piece was, was R&D. How did they shift from blocks made of carbon to a different type of material that would be still strong enough and rigid enough, but wouldn't have the same footprint? And then shorter term, how they got all of their existing suppliers to switch to renewable energy to change their shipment methods. So the, the different sets of levers, and those will be different for your different categories. So you know how big your problem is, you know what your options are about how you're going to fix it. How are you going to get anyone to actually do it? So back to the point from earlier on spending is voting. If procurement are not engaged in this, and if your procurement function think that their key outcome is cost of purchase, then you'll never make any progress. So again, with this, with this toy company, we were in an event with all of their suppliers. And the CEO gave this beautiful motivational speech about why this was so important and the future and the children. And it was lovely. And everyone nodded. And then the CPO stood up and went, so to be clear, we're changing our tendering process. As well as cost, we're going to ask for your carbon footprint, we're going to ask for your three-year reduction. And if you're not meeting that, you will be removed from the tender. And then people sat up. Oh, yeah. Teeth are important. So it was, it, again, it's very effective, but you, you do have to invest in what are the processes that will make that real. And then once you've got that, because again, it was a great kickoff event, stands were made, but then how are you going to embed it? What is the org design you're going to need in order to bring this to life in a sustainable, repeatable way? And finally, the thread that runs across all of these is you've got to engage your suppliers. You cannot do this alone. And depending on your supply base, you need to figure out the right combination of stick and carrot. How are you going to incentivize them? How are you going to encourage them to come on the journey? How are you going to enable them on that journey? But then also, how are you going to have the conversation you need to have if things aren't moving forward? So there's that supplier ecosystem piece, again, is really important. And we know when you start on this journey, it's it's complicated. This is not as simple as, you know, have a meeting or two and, and you get there. So what are the, the different factors to have in mind? One that we all struggle with is supplier fragmentation. There are certain suppliers that they're, they're terribly important to you. They're the only ones that supply the particular color you need for your lipstick, speaking from personal experience. Um, however, you're tiny to them. You don't have buying power or influence in that relationship. So that's one challenge. And the other is in areas, say, freight. You might have three big freight um, providers who are big companies and who you have very strong relationships with and who are quite mature in this journey. And you might have three small local hauliers who are critical for overflow capacity. But they're very early in the journey for this. And that's why we say looking at categories is so helpful, because you can then try and build the capability across those categories. So again, going back to that toy company, after they'd had sort of the high level discussion with the CEO going, we really should, and the CPO going, and if you don't, you can't play, there was then sub-conversations per sector, and those focused on educating and enabling them. So they said basically through two lenses. One, if you work in resins, these are eight different things you can do to improve your carbon footprint. And secondly, if you work in Germany, these are all the different low carbon energy providers in Germany, because that's the fastest thing you can do is switch your energy supply. And that was provided to every single supplier for their technology and for their geography. So it was a real partnership, a real focus on enabling them and building their skills and capabilities. So that was really, really effective. And that, that helps a lot in the supplier knowledge piece as well. Um, I was talking with someone in the breakout areas around data assurance. 
So again, how can you get reasonable quality data from your suppliers? And that some of that is negotiation. As we said, some of that is being as practical as possible with what you've got. Uh, individual resistance. We're all grown-ups. We've all done many, many change management programs. This needs change management in exactly the same ways as everything else. There will be early adopters, there will be laggards. So you will need a conscious change management program in order to bring people with you. And that's why earlier we showed some of the facts and figures and talked about the other non-carbon, clear, concrete business benefits. And then the last one, which helps us considerably versus where we were five years ago on this, is tools and technology. There is a lot more out there in terms of data, in terms of being able to gather options and sort of do much more practical things than was there before. Even, you know, nice toys like digital twins. They're great for scenario modeling around some of this stuff. Um, I'm working with um, a company at the moment who are, re who are moving around their physical network. And through the modeling tools, you do an awful lot of well, what if? And that, that's proving really helpful. And then, related to all of those, I just wanted to touch specifically on the talent agenda. So supply chain, we've never been so sexy. It's an incredibly popular and busy uh, business area right now. We're all really struggling to get the best talent. But the best talent really care about this. Purpose is much, much, much more important than it used to be. And I don't just mean for the 20-somethings. I mean all of us, after what we've lived through in the last few years. We care about where we work. We care that they share our values. And I think all of our individual consciousness on this topic is much higher than it was five, 10 years ago. So for purpose, this matters. COP26, I think, was a tipping point for many people in their knowledge and awareness in this space. So that was another inflection. Another one is there is zero tolerance for greenwashing. And again, back to that social media, back to the speed at which information travels. Anything we put out there now, we need to be able to stand over. The Great Resignation is probably part of the tail end of COVID and goes back to that purpose piece. And the last one is actually um, slightly more anecdotal. It's around diverse candidates. We're all looking for diverse candidates. Diverse candidates seem to care more about this because they see if a firm has a breadth of things it invests in, and if a firm cares about social good and the environment and its impact on the world, it's more likely to be an inclusive, embracing environment than one that goes, we are purely about profit. So there are, there are advantages in the talent space as well. And I'll leave you with one last picture, and an element of now or never. So between COVID and Brexit, all of our businesses have changed a lot in the last two or three years. And that probably means for many of us, our old supply chain, our 2019 supply chain, is not fit for purpose for our future business, and we're having to review it. But touching your supply chain, it's like moving house. It is painful, it is expensive, you do not want to do it very often. So in the same way, if you're moving house with toddlers, you look at the local schools, you look at the local secondary schools. Again, if you're touching your supply chain now because of Brexit and COVID, it needs to be future fit, it needs to work for the next 15, 20 years. So before you start, pull that sustainability strategy out of the drawer, say what commitments have we made for 2030, for 2040? And am I going to design the supply chain now that will get us there? And if you pull it out and go, the commitment's 2050, I don't need to worry. There'll be a new CEO between now and then. So do a little sort of sense check going, are these targets realistic before you move to implement them? But yes, I do think there's a, a wee element of now or never. Okay, any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you very much, Maureen. It's really, really interesting. Any questions from the floor? No? Well, we do have some questions coming. Oh, I beg your pardon. Oh, well, I think you've had your turn, sir. So anybody else? Yeah, um, we have a question from uh, our, one of our remote, many remote uh, attendees, a slightly philosophical one. Um, does it matter if a company is behaving sustainably not because they want to save the planet, but because they're trying to protect their bottom line? Does the motive matter? If you're talking about a, a personal relationship or, the, you know, don't marry someone about the motives, but for business, you want them to do the right thing. And 
I'm not sure I care why someone will make sure my children have a planet to live on. I would just really like them to have a planet. So if people are doing for pure profit, but they're doing the right thing, and that's why we talked about the business imperative, because what you need is the market to drive the right outcomes, because if it's based purely on altruistic and everyone having to make huge personal sacrifices, only a handful will do it. It's a groundswell of hard-nosed business that will drive the scale of change we need, because it's, it's 2022, we are running out of time. So I will take every stick, I will take every lever. Thank you. And you mentioned earlier on, you know, that uh, especially around COP26, mm -hmm. everybody making grand pronouncements about mm -hmm. roadmaps and when they're going to be hitting these sustainability targets, uh, but without necessarily, you know, speaking to the supply chain first. Mm -hmm. But is there a, a best practice way that organisations can engage suppliers, uh, you know, at the beginning of the process? Absolutely. Um, so the, the toy manufacturer I talked about earlier, I thought did brilliantly in that they started with high level engagement, you know, CEO to CEO with the CPO. And then they went to sub levels, which was based per sector and the sustainability lead to sustainability lead. And they said, this is our three year path. These are the things that need to happen. This is how for you to be a long term strategic supplier of ours, how we would like you to come with us on the journey. And this is how we will enable you. This is the support, the information, the sure. structure we will give you. Because there's a lot of discussion around, um, around networks, which I think is really relevant. Because a lot of our industries, it's, it's very tight margin. And um, whereas if you're working across a network and there's commitment to this goal, then it's much more feasible. So there's a lovely example about um, cars, and it was an American example. So they were saying a car is $35,000, quite a lot. The most carbon intensive element of that car is the, the steel. And steel is quite difficult to decarbonize. So you've got an average of $1,000 of steel in that car. To use zero carbon steel, it's a 50% increase. It's 1,500. So in the context of someone who's looking just at the price of that steel, that's an awful lot. But if you say, actually, as a part of the car, that's, that's a 2% price change. And I believe I can have that value discussion with my customers about it's worth paying 2% more for the car for this massive impact on its carbon footprint. So again, it's that network thinking. And in the zero carbon steel, there's been some really interesting collaboration across the different steel manufacturers to try and drive to that new standard. So I think the collaboration piece is really important to do, to make meaningful scaled change. Sure. And uh, Beringer is a, a B Corp uh, yes. organization. Um, somebody's asking, it, does an organization need to have B Corp status before it can be taken seriously on its uh, you know, claims around sustainability in the supply chain? So it doesn't need to. Um, we were, we as a company sort of thought a lot about this. We'd invest a lot in our sustainability agenda. We were um, already at net zero, and we're very people business. I mean, we're consultants. All we have to sell are brilliant people, so we need the very best people. So for us, it was really important, and we were quite analytical. So we wanted a measurement and a certification, but we also wanted to be part of the community of B Corp companies. So I mean, there's Ella's Kitchen, there's all these fabulous companies that are part of that, and there's a wonderful community and a wonderful sharing of ideas and best practice. So for us, it's an enricher for the work that we do. So it's not that we wouldn't be a good, sustainable company if we didn't have this tick, but it, help, a, it, it helps us hold ourselves accountable to a really high standard, um, and B, it enables us to engage with this really great community. Sure. And um, when, when you're going into companies, Maureen, and, and they're at the sort of uh, the beginning of their sustainability journey, uh, both internally and, you know, in their supply chain, mm -hmm. how, what do you advise them to do in order to, to bring their employees along with them on that journey? So generally, bringing the employees with you is, is one of the easier parts, because I think most of us as individuals care quite a lot about this. So it's always useful to have consultation. It's always useful to you know, check on what are the most important parts for your, your um, employees. But generally, they just want to know what you're doing, you know, what are the ambitions, and what are you doing about those, and how can they be part of that. So I, unless anyone tells me otherwise, I haven't come across a case yet of the employees resisting this. Great. That's, well, sadly, that's all we've got time for thank today. But thank you very much, uh, Maureen O'Shea Baringa. Thank, thank you. you.